uh, we are uh, speaking uh, on the topic of the cultural industries and cultural policy in Asia. We have two speakers who are going to give us perspectives on cultural industries and policy, respectively in China and Korea. And they'll be talking about the similarities, the differences, and also the relationships between uh, the industries and policy in those two countries. Uh, so I'm del delighted to welcome today Professors Anthony Fung and Professor Shin Dong Kim. So um, it's, uh, it's quite a rare pleasure to have uh, two in one, two for the price of one, two speakers in the same seminar. So what we're going to do today is um, to ask each speaker to, to start by giving a short presentation of 20 minutes or so. Um, what I'll do is I'll introduce them separately. Uh, and I encourage everybody who's, who's listening, please, uh, to write your questions for the speakers in the Q&A box that you see uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, write your questions as they occur to you, please, while the speakers are talking. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll listen to both presentations and then we'll take all the uh, questions together so we can get something of a conversation going. All right. So um, without further ado, our first speaker, um, Anthony Fung, uh, real pleasure to have you with us. Um, Anthony Fung is professor in the School of Journalism and Communication at the Chinese University of Hong Kong uh, and also professor in the School of Art and Communication at Beijing Normal University. Um, Anthony's uh, research and teaching focus on popular culture, youth identities, uh, cultural industries and digital media. Uh, and he has a series of um, books out in the past few years. Uh, one important one is uh, Youth Cultures in China. Uh, two recent books on the gaming industries, one uh, taking a global perspective and one specifically focusing on Hong Kong. Uh, and the most recent book is uh, Made in Hong Kong Studies in Popular Music, which is already essential reading for some of my students. Uh, but his talk today is going to focus on the gaming industries in China. So over to you, Professor Fong. Thank you. Um, uh, let me share my screen first. Um, uh, actually, first of all, I would like to uh, so thank uh, Shin Dong Kim. Um, um, he was uh, in our school uh, for the last semester. So we talk a thousand times, and, and we also collaborate uh, earlier on on writing um, like issues about cultural industries in Asia. So um, so this time, oh, uh, I was uh, invited by Rachel and then I thought, okay, maybe we, we should do something more interactive this time. Um, so that's why I picked a topic on cultural policy and game industry in China. And, and this topic in fact is highly related to um, Korean cultural industries. So that's why uh, I invited Seem to come, um, uh, and then I think our talks complement to each other. So let let's um, talk about um, um, the game industry. Okay, uh, this is these two are my former books on game industries. Today's talks are based on some of the points here, and I added some new development of the game industries and culture policy uh, in China. And I want to say that I'm not just a scholar. Um, I was a uh, the consultant of the Hong Kong Game Industry Association. And until uh, a week ago, I was still the director of a listed game company in Hong Kong. So I actually had, had involvement with some of the game business. So that's why I could like, sometimes I know more about industries uh, by interviewing the key people in the industries. So now let's focus on today's talk, which is the cultural policy in China. And I want to use it as an example uh, for cultural industries. And game industry is actually not too much different from other like creative industries in China. And the characteristic is that um, it is highly driven by top-down policies of the government, of the PLC. 
Um, at this point, um, South Korea is really important because um, like the, the model of cultural industry, creative industries in South Korea is always regarded as a good example for Chinese government. So in fact, like in, in game industries, a lot of the early development of the culture policy, in fact, is, in, is modeling um, um, the Korean side. Um, although this is a kind of perception, and the Korean, like the Chinese government always perceived that um, Korean government has a really strong like poli national policy on game. So that's why they want to repeat the same story. Um, and like a uh, cultural policy, like like always, like for China or for South Korea or for other countries. In fact, um, I would say like in some, there are, there are two major purposes that I want to emphasize in talk. First is about nationalism. That is a kind of uh, um, like, like soft power for the China for China, and it's mostly about um the financial side, like it's a kind of, like, say export of it, but nationalism is also about China itself. Like um, in fact, um, game content can also be good examples of like like incubating people, good values, and 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 so that's why it involves issues like censorship and content control. Um. I want to say, like in the very beginning, as a cultural studies scholar, um, in fact, in this area, people try to like, like, um, be uncritical of the so-called cultural policy. Say, like for me, I'm a cultural studies scholar, and and sometimes I like I step over. I also do cultural policy research. I also like always remind myself, like cultural policy is not just for the industry. Sometimes. We should be like taking a like a critical look at the policy. Say, could it create more cultural politics, more inequality, more power politics within industry or or between the industry and other industries? And in fact, um, like what in fact, like in the early days when when there's no there was no like tradition of so called cultural policy, people talk about political economy, and at that time people were really critical but now it seems that like the whole spectrum actually went to, to towards the other side there is the kind of uh, um, development of the industries with the support of the culture policy and so that's why i try to like have a kind of like balance wheel between culture studies and political economy when i do these policy studies um and what is cultural industry um, like for China? And, and basically, the early thinking about cultural industry is just a kind of export for GDP. That is a kind of like soft power. Um, in general, Asia wrote an article about the four creative industries in China, uh, music, game, film, comic, or animations. And each of the industries actually share their own characteristics. Say, game industries, are you like used to like used to be the own the most profitable profitable industries for China like like um it's not just internal but also like um like they export a lot of games to other countries as well and um and and that that kind of like industries model is always regarded as kind of Korean model in the early days uh, although like Shin is going to say that 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 may not be true. Okay. Um, the second is about like comic and animation industry. Um, and and it, it is commercially the least successful simply because like comic animations in China is regarded as a commodity, not for adults, not for adolescents, but for like, like young kids. So in fact, for young kids, they, they don't care. Like they cannot generate a lot of values. Yeah, unlike Japan, uh, most of the animation comics are for adults. So that's why they generate a lot of revenue from that. So, so like for China, it's nestled. For music industry, I, I would say um, it's the, the, uh, the most popular one. And, and there's import and export of music. Um, and music for China has for a long time used that for propaganda as well as for entertainment purpose. So this is the mostly a mixed industry. For film, um, film is highly like, 
monopolized by the state because um, the content is regarded as a kind of political tool rather than a commercial product. Now, now I try to focus um, more on, on game. But the issue is always like that. Um, there, are, there are always um, uh, two major theoretical dimensions. First is globalization. In fact, um, um, people see that like in China, see like game as a way to boost, uh, say, the local market, local industry, local development. And when it is exported to other countries, then it could bring GDP revenues to, to China. And, and second, it's about political control and state ideologies. Um, when there's a content, there must be a, some kind of control or regulations at least. And sometimes the first one and the second ones are contradictory. But I wanna emphasize that. Um, in fact, uh, people in this state talk too much about the control of the games in terms of content. Uh, in, in fact, uh, if you, like if you, I am a, a, like a, a scholar actually reading those kind of like uh, regulations. In fact, more, more regulations are talking about how to boost the industry, like the local market at state level, at provincial level, at city levels. Um, in fact, uh, the kind of like control, like put in control, um, like, like, like high of regulations are not that much. So, so in, in fact, there's kind of mis misconception. I want to highlight this in the very beginning. Um, and, and let's say, like, think about in early days, game is not like, 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 like a kind of early development from China. In fact, in the early days, the most successful game industries in China are from Korea. So that's why um, in the early days, in fact, um, it's really dependent on foreign know-how management. And, 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 and like in the early days, in the like early year 2000, there are a lot of import from, from Korea. Um, in the early model, the early model is that in fact, the uh, Korean uh, game company actually have a lot of collaboration with uh, the Chinese game companies. But the problem is that like the type of um, collaboration with this kind of global capital, um, the uh, Korean capitals would like, like being upon this kind of so-called reliance, dependence on, on Korea. So that's why um, China, China tends to get rid of this kind of dependency as it goes along with its development. Second, um, it's more about the ideological control. Um, well, I will skip a little bit because of time, but but you can imagine what is in that about. Um, so there's always when we talk about game, it's always a dual nature of politics and market. Um, um, and when a profit is like inseparable from political control, um, and every every game industry have to think about its political and economic limits. Um, and there's always logic of all the like 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 game industry in China. Okay, um, I, I don't want to talk about that in the details, but you know that uh, why game is so important in China is simply because like if you take a, compare the global box office, the film film office, film box office ticket sales, it's much smaller than the global game industry revenues. Um, now, now it seems that we have a lot of research about film industry, films actually, people all talk about film. But in fact, the research on game industry are, are much fewer and, and, and there are a lot more details about it. And Asia Pacific is always the highest, like the share is the highest game revenues. And, and for China, there are, uh, and for Asia as well, and it, it actually shares uh, the most, uh, the, the large number of global gamers in the world and much bigger than other markets, you can see. And the market is rising, you can see that. Um, I want to skip that, this a little bit. And you can tell that and it's a lot of money. So in fact, uh, when we talk about cultural policy, it's more about how the government actually give a kind of environment for the game industry to grow. And, and the second point is that it prevents other companies from going in to share the market. So now nowadays, um, like 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 almost uh, a lot of like 
early Korean game industry companies which like went into China. Now, now many of them actually quit, and then uh, and then China actually start a lot of their own company and then um, export to Korea as well. Um, there are three main uh, like like I would say milestones for China's cultural policy, uh, which like the first one is two o two when um, when these kind of industries are not so prominent and people don't get government even don't know what's what's game industry and they don't know about that. Um, so it's really peripheral. They 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 start to think about um how to promote it um in the 10 five years plan in 2002 but like like just a few years later from 2006 to 2010 um that like 11 five years plan is the major step for the development of um game industries in china um basically it models a lot of uh, so-called policies on cultural industries from korea and then you also develop and regulate the kind of participation of private capital in cultural industry, and then try to absorb a lot of foreign elements. And so a lot of joint collaboration happens in the early days. But as time goes by, Chinese game companies like Tencent um, and Shanghai, and then becomes the, the major ones. And then they, they start to like develop its international market and even acquire a lot of major game companies in the world and and just uh, like uh in the past year uh there was a, a there was a, another new plans of cultural industry um they it's not just talking about the quantity they want to use it talk about the quality of cultural industry game industry and um they also wants to increase the cultural con consumption to boost gdp although although uh, you might hear that, uh, in fact, um, like like China tries to crack down some of the like like game their games which are unhealthy or portray some like unhealthy values to the kids or something like that. But but the agenda of cultural consumption is still on the plan. Um, and onto because of time, I want to actually um like shorten it a little bit. Probably you know that what is, uh, what is the regulated. The, these are the regulating bodies uh, for, about games. So there are lots of like regulating bodies. But starting like started last year, all these kind of like, like regulating body, regulating bodies uh, are consolidated. And then uh, now there's a new uh, unit called NRTA, National Radio and Television Administration. Uh, it seems to be real, right? Uh, television radio. But, but in fact, is that administration? Uh, that publish or, or regulate lies on the scam industry. So, so you imagine that like games in China is still a kind of publication. Publication means what? Means ideology. And, and the initial goal of this regulation is, as I mentioned, domestic market and going out for like as a soft power. But I would like, like, like in a very um in a in in a short time we will say that it changes a little bit like in in a, uh, in these years, um and I I know that you also always talk about like hear a lot of controls of games in in um in China and that that it, actually I would say that in my book this is not a, a a big surprise in fact in in many other countries even in Japan um say for example the classification of games like to prevent like like kids from addiction it's quite quite common um and it happens in many other countries as well but the most important thing in in the regulation and policies in china is about the financial support that is say for example they give tax rebate uh to those like games which like like uh, export to other countries and give direct subsidies to them um and say they also uh, like have tax incentive for uh, like uh, those game companies say they are located in certain technological park they they actually they, they they give them some kind of like city tax like like rebate something like that and there are a lot of other law and public capital support as well um of course um the most important thing you might want to 
highlight. I, I know everybody will, will ask what what is kind what, what is the kind of censorship. So I want to like 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 skip that and talk about the the, the censorship um, right now. Um, um, the censorship is basically a kind of like um, a kind of measure to strengthen strengthen the supervision and control of the content. And it's like that. Uh, it is like it's no no surprise. Um, in fact, there is a committee uh, in every city in say in in Beijing. Um, it is composed of like scholars, like like scholars. I, actually, I, I I I know myself. Um, and also experts from from the, from the film industry, from the other creative industries, and also some government officials. They change it every two years, and they just they just a kind of committee meeting frequently to judge the gaps, and then um, they just pinpoint like uh, the kind of main problem of games and ask them to to revise before they can publish. Um, so usually they focus more on violence pornographic and reactionary context. So I um and probably you you know this game, right? This is a game like uh, um it, I I I I suppose a lot of audience here are, are youngsters. Uh this uh this uh kind of battleground games is really common in the in the in the past two or three years. Um this is the probably the the kind of um the version that you have played um, in a Western context, but in fact, it's owned up by Tencent. So in 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 China, they actually they in the past they they would just localize it. Say they, they, you can see they say kind of there are Chinese characters, but but nowadays as the kind of um, control is getting more and more stranger. So uh, the, the, my earlier point was saying that in fact the early days. Uh, for this cultural policy is to strengthen the kind of financial capital to promote the gaming companies and develop it. But now they, it seems that um, China has actually put more emphasis on, on politics, on ideological control. Um, it doesn't mean that game companies would not survive, but it survived in other ways. So I give you another picture. Um, yeah, this is a picture. This is the same kind of battle game that you will see in China. Um, the characters might not be, it still can be a Westerners, Westerners, it can be any like nationality, but you can see there's a banner at the back. The banner is that, oh, basically, uh, they regard this kind of combat is not a real battlefield. This is a military training for the people. So in, in fact, uh, first of all, they are not promoting this kind of like, like violence. They are actually doing some kind of military rehearsal for the countries. And, and then the banner actually is kind of saying that uh, in fact, uh, the training is for the good of the party, for the good of, um, uh, of the state. So, in, so that's why the, um, all the games have to like, like I would say synchronize with the state policies to survive. So um, this actually is um, like uh, echo with my points earlier. Like every game companies have to consider both the economic as well as the political constraints. Uh, in the early days, they, con they were concerned with more economic constraints. But now uh, it seems that um, they put more emphasis on this kind of political constraints. Um, in, um, you, you can see, oh, of course, there are also um, uh, games, like this, this game, like it's not just kind of causing roles game, but it's also some kind of healthy games promoted by the government, say uh, you, you have to learn from certain models. There's this good model, um, a good political models, and then not to say not to break the rules. Um, this is a kind of games promoted by the government. And also, uh, like, let's see. They also have a, like these kind of like strategy games look like we really, like really this is not not it's quite common it's not uh it's a quite quite like a uh, very interesting game but they use the game to promote anti corruption so in um so many of the game companies actually survive by actually uh, also focusing on the political agendas um. Uh, instead of just focusing on the economic agenda. 
So that's why um, um, the recently there have been like some changes in, in the um, so-called the, the, the ecology of game industries in, in China. Um, maybe um, uh, see, I, I want to sum up my, my, my point. Um, in fact, um, in the early days, um, they more or less like the cap companies focus more on the market support and the cultural policy is more on domestic control and internal protection of the market. Say um, they, they don't want like the Korean markets from coming in so much. But nowadays, uh, there are more, more and more um, political controls like stepping in to the game industries. Um, as I actually, I, I, I talk a lot of Korean examples. Um, so for the next 20 minutes, I will hand over to Shin Dong Kim and then um, to talk about what the, the Chinese comparison with the Korean industries, whether this is correct or not. So Shin Dong, your time. Hey, hey, that is really great. Thank you very much, Anthony. Huh. Um, yeah, it's really interesting to see these examples and the, the, the figures are just extraordinary, always with China, of course. Huh. Um, so um, participants, please. I can see a couple of questions in the Q&A, but I'd like to see many more. Um, I'm afraid the security setup on our seminars is so tight that for you participants, the only way to get your voice across is to type your question in the Q&A. So I urge you, please, to uh, um, write down your, your questions for Professor Fung and share them now before you forget, uh, as you undoubtedly will, as you are um, excited to listen to uh, Professor Kim's um, talk. So um, mm -hmm. let me introduce, without further ado, our second speaker. Uh, Professor Shin Dong Kim uh, works at the Media School of Harlem University in Korea. Um, his research and teaching covers the cultural industries, media culture, and East Asian cinema in particular. Uh, and he also, which I'm very fascinated about, um, he also leads the soul based think tank called Knowledge Co op for Good Governance. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Kim's recent publications include the digitalization of K pop. Uh, and the globalization of Korean film industry. Uh, and he's particularly interested in media co-evolution, uh, this idea which conceptualizes uh, the mutual development of platforms and content in media industries. So today, as um, Anthony's already um, noted, um, Professor Kim is going to talk to us about um, industry and policy in Korea. Professor Kim, thank you. Okay. Uh... Thanks very much, Rachel, for introduction. And also thank uh, Anthony for inviting me to join. Um, let me share with my slides first. Where did it go? Okay. Well, um, I may have to skip uh, quite a lot of slides today, but uh, uh, well, basically the topic that uh, I'm going to talk is not much different from what Anthony has been talking about the uh, case of China in terms of developing game industry. And uh, as he uh, correctly pointed out, uh, uh, in China, the censorship is one of the uh, interesting questions, you know, uh, um, between uh, using nationalism as uh, a way of developing uh, uh, all kinds of different media. And also uh, the Chinese government wanted to uh, uh, achieve the national branding uh, impact out of it. But uh, as a matter of fact, the more the uh, contents are based on the nationalistic sentiment, the impact of national branding actually decreases in the uh, global community. So uh, this is a interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, contradiction, uh, but the Chinese government at this point seems to be uh, putting a lot of effort on uh, emphasizing 
nationalism and their national sentiment. Um, and obviously this is posing a, a big uh, dilemma in their uh, cultural uh, policy in developing not only the game industry, but in developing film industry and then other media sectors. Um, well, uh, Korea has been the uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, frontier state in terms of developing online games. And uh, uh, China, uh, especially like 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, was very active in uh, uh, emulating Korean experiences in developing media industries, especially uh, including the, uh, 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 including this part. But uh, different from the case of China, I don't think Korea has the uh, contradiction between the uh, content censorship and the industrial uh, policy in developing media industries like uh, uh, game industries. Um, now, as many of you are aware that the K-pop is making a worldwide awareness and uh, it even uh, increases the awareness or the uh, on, on the uh, on the nation Korea, you know. So in in terms of the nation branding and the public diplomacy, K-pop is making a, a huge impact and then uh, uh, contributions. Um, you know, for example, many of the uh, universities in European communities now are seeing the increase of Korean language education fever. Uh, this is, uh, for example, a case in, at the uh, University of Copenhagen last year, how the uh, applicants are increasing rapidly in Korean studies program there. And then obviously that's the uh, impact of the Korean culture and Korean pop culture. And we say that uh, in the growth of uh, Korean pop culture, there could be many different factors, uh, micro level and macro level or domestic factors or international factors. But uh, even though there are so many complicated factors working at the same time, somehow, uh, you know, if we are looking at the international uh, media uh, outlets or even in uh, academic uh, discourses, many uh, authors are pointing out the impact of the uh, government policy in developing uh, Korea's media industries, uh, even including game industry. For example, here, here is a, uh, a, a man uh, called Martin Roll. He's a business consultant and then he's having a very successful website of his own company. And then in his analysis on the way Korean uh, uh, pop culture success, like the rise of Korea's cultural economy and pop culture, he is like for example, uh, pointing out the continuous support from the Korean government, okay? And he's not the only one uh, pointing out the continuous and relentless support from the, from the Korean government. Uh, and then the, uh, it's one of the major uh, factors which is driving the Korean cultural or creative industries to the success. Uh, uh, CNN report, for example, is, uh, Another one of the many, many, uh, you know, uh, common reports, which is again pointing out the government has also backed the expansion of the country's culture industry abroad, uh, seeing it as a vehicle for soft power. Okay, so government is coming again and again as one of the major, major, you know, important uh, uh, driver of the. Uh, for example, here another uh, website is saying that uh, it began as a deliberate strategy orchestrated by the Korean government. Okay. I see, sorry, but that the, the PowerPoint is not moving though. Can you, it's not like, moving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, maybe you have to um, have the full, full screen so that it will move. So now it's still, it stopped. Uh, it, like, it, 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 is it still stop at the- uh, Yeah, it stopped on stop? PowerPoint 18. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh my thanks god me. thanks for um dipping in there how about now what, what, uh, are you yeah. still seeing the first slide yeah we didn't see the first slide yeah. we're on slide 16 and you're not full screen <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah. okay okay wait a minute okay 
How about now? I can't no? see that. Well, I, the, the screen that I'm seeing is different from yours. Uh, I, I'm yeah. seeing uh, 14. Okay, okay. I, uh, let me, maybe I'll, I'll Do it like share the screen uh, again. Do you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you worse, you worse. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, I, I quickly mentioned that the, the media outlets like this are, are constantly and repeatedly uh, emphasizing the role of the Korean government in making the success of Korean culture industries. Uh, and it's been cited by like uh, media like CNN. Uh, or other web media like this. This is uh, box.com. And uh, they are posting this kind of uh, stories on Instagram, on Facebook, and other social media, on YouTube. And then the, the uh, story is, you know, uh, almost like monolithic. So it began as a deliberate strategy orchestrated by the Korean government. I, uh, I would say, you know, um, it's not, you know, <laughs> the uh, success, the overall success of the uh, cultural industries in Korea uh, was mainly engineered and driven by the industries themselves, rather than the uh, Korean government's planning and then uh, support. I'm not saying that the Korean state did nothing for or the success of the uh, culture industries, but uh, uh, just to give a give a balance to the ongoing like a misleading uh, discourse, I should emphasize, you know, why uh, the state's role uh, has been perceived as major factors in uh, international media. You know, when they are explaining the success of the Korean, you know, uh, industries, including you know uh, the, uh, the uh, game industries. One of the uh, reason why is that conventional practice of bureaucracy. Uh, you know, if you see, uh, if you're visiting like Ministry of Culture uh, of Korean government, you know, they are providing all this data and then explaining what they are doing, you know, for the success of the Korean uh, industries. It's, it's pretty much like self-serving website information. So. Obviously, the government official website is providing a lot of information on what they do, okay? But that doesn't mean that the, what they wanted to do is always working and then producing the intended consequence. Uh, and there's also a conventional practice of journalism. And then the journalists, whether it's domestic or international, they tend to uh, rely upon the official source, which is again, the self-serving website of the government, uh, uh, you know, ministries. And then there are uh, amateur advocators. If you see the YouTube, you know, many people are talking about their, uh, you know, uh, their own theories and hypotheses on the success of the uh, uh, K-pop. And then uh, they are also depending upon these like uh, pre-existing sources. So it's like a citation of wrongful information in, in a spiral ways. And then it, it is uh, resulting uh, a like a, a creation of a, a kind of fake truth. Um, there is another line of thinking, which is the Korea's unique history of economic development in which the state uh, initiated the export law, export oriented development, you know, economic development in the 1960s and 70s. So for the foreign observers or, or scholars, it's, it's, there is a strong temptation to impose this economic development model, you know, state-led economic development model upon the uh, culture industry sectors. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, this is a very old Korean uh, TV series drama, serial drama which was very, very popular in, uh, at the early part of the 21st century. It first broadcasted on the national channel, KBS. And then uh, next year, it was exported to Japanese uh, you know, uh, 
NHK. And then, uh, you know, totally unexpectedly, uh, it made a huge like, success. And then it, it is actually signaling the, the beginning of the uh, so-called Korean wave in Japan and then in East Asia. Huge popularity and opener of the Korean wave in Japan. And that means that in early like uh, 2000, the, 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 uh, the popularity of K-pop and then Korean wave really swept uh, East Asian communities. And then, but the uh, Korean government was totally unaware of what, what was actually going on, you know? So it means that if Korean government planned and then uh, supported and even developed the uh, so-called Korean wave, they must have fully aware, you know, uh, what's going on, but it was not the case. Okay? So I would say government was actually following uh, what was already happening in industrial uh, scene uh, up to even these days, like if it's, some of you may have known the, the Parasite, the uh, uh, you know, award-winning uh, film. And then public diplomacy has also been a uh, strong temptation for the government side to use the success of the Korean pop culture in using, you know, uh, using uh, in, uh, the promoting the nation branding. So uh, that's also uh, a part that, uh, you know, uh, painting uh, the, the sort of a wrongful image on the role of the state. But uh, that doesn't mean that the Korean state did nothing, okay? I mean, state uh, do, uh, or Korean state especially does uh, things to help the development of uh, culture industries, and game industries, uh, for example, the state policy is always there, like on any kind of industry, not only the game industry, but any any kind of industry. What uh, uh, and then the state intervention on any kind of industry comes into two ways, as you know. One is regulation, and the other one is promotion. Okay, so uh, regulation of contents, market entry, and competition fair competition, ownership, control, and technological standard, et cetera. These are all the subjects of government regulation for, for helping the development of any industry. And promotion for industrial development is also there, not only in game industry, but any, you know, electronic industries or you know, shipbuildings or, or, or mobile phone productions, you know, whatever you, you say. And uh, constituting the agency, COCA, for example, is uh, uh, by consolidating similar, similar promotional agencies in music, film, broadcasting, game, animation. At the turn of the century, you know, in Korea, we have many different, uh, you know, agencies which were designed to support, to provide, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of support for the development of film, music, broadcasting, game, animation, etc. But the Korean government decided to consolidate all these uh, separated agencies and under one like a grand uh, umbrella institution, which is COCA. It's Korean like a creative uh, contents agency or something. Um, so, uh, you know, government intervention or government policy on creative and culture industries, including game industry comes in two ways, one regulation and the other one promotion. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, by regulation, the purpose is obviously creating the sound environment for the development, sound environment. And then by the promotive, uh, promotional uh, uh, intervention, uh, the government wants to encourage funding and investing in uh, game industries and other industries, uh, or we can say incubating and facility offer, game academy for developing human resources, investment cooperation, export promotion, supporting the participation of international markets, supplying information and analysis on game industries. All these kind of things are provided by the agencies, you know. Uh, for the development of uh, game industries. Uh, 
As a matter of fact, it we started in 1999 from the legalization of uh, uh, an act, you know. Uh, so I would say legalization is an important step for government intervention I mean, because government agencies or government uh, minister ministries cannot enact without having like a legal uh, legal like uh, uh, background, you know. So in 1999, there was a first uh, legalization of, of act on record video and game development, which was uh, revised and then expanded uh, to the act of promoting game industries in 2006. So based on these laws, the government uh, involved and then intervened in the development of game industries. And uh, the government also tried to shape the image of game uh, in a positive way, because games, as you may know, if you visit the uh, online game sites, many of these games are, are connected to the uh, gamblings. Okay, many of these games are connected to the pornography. Okay, so. Uh, the public image on the game industry at the beginning of the uh, uh, like a 21st century was pretty much negative. You know, parents are always so much worried about uh, their kids uh, playing, you know, spending time on games, you know. Uh, so the government wanted to uh, turn this negative image on the games to the positive one or at least a neutral one by regulating the uh, practices of game industry by like, uh, uh, for example, introducing the rating system based on law and uh, divided the uh, games into four different level categories, you know, for, just like we do for the TV programs or uh, films. Uh, and uh, there are other like protecting measures for the minors, like a shutdown system or regulating uh, gamblings. And this is all from, you know, from the government support. And uh, the Korean government uh, adopted the pro promotional measures in, uh, in, the, in the following ways, for example, the incubating, you know, incubating is in, in most cases, the most basic and then uh, primary, but most important uh, promotional measure which is uh, providing free business space and facilities for startups for a limited period of time, typically like three years, but expandable to six years. So even if you don't have uh, enough uh, 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 startup money, uh, you can still uh, secure, I mean, uh, some uh, you know, facilities and space for for your business, you know, and and actually there there has been many uh, successful uh, game companies which started from this incubating facility to become a global uh, game company. Uh, the second way uh, was supporting the production cost directly. You know, they they uh, uh, throughout the uh, like uh, you know uh, contest or some kind of uh, uh, selection. The government actually uh, provide the direct support of the production cost, or the seeding, the investment uh, fundraising. The government organize a uh, angel investors and then making a fundraising uh, scheme, uh, and also export promotion uh, using other government arms and training the professional human resource through the privately instituted game academies. If you type in like a uh, Google in Korea about the game academy, then there are endless number of uh, private, private institutions uh, in which you can get the, uh, you know, free training, you know, free education and training. It's not free actually, but you don't need to pay. Uh, actually the government pays for the tuition uh, as long as you uh, participate in the uh, learning uh, program. And then this is under the control of the Ministry of Labor and Employment. Uh, and research and public education is also an important uh, resources for the development of game programs and uh, new games uh, or, or the uh, setting up the new plan for, for uh, different types of uh, games. And supporting the exhibitions and conventions also is a part of the 
uh, state uh, uh, intervention and state support. So uh, my point, you know, in, in short, and to summarize that uh, there's been a like almost like a mythological belief that the development of uh, creative culture industries in Korea, including game industry, is really well planned and then uh, supported by the Korean government. And I said, uh, which is not true. You know, that's not true. Actually, the most important part, the most important actor, which uh, is developing all these cultural and creative industries, uh, whether it is game or film or TV dramas or you know animation, comes from the industries themselves. You know, Korea is pretty much a um, uh, you know, free market uh, capitalist society. So uh, the limit of the government in intervention, even if they got the government wanted to do a lot of things, you know, is quite limited, quite uh, obviously limited. You know, Korean economy is uh, quite sizable and then uh, the, just simply the political system and the market system doesn't give the government that much of dominant uh, initiative room. But that doesn't mean that the Korean government doesn't do anything. They actually do uh, a lot of things by ways of uh, regulation and promotion. By regulation, they try to create like a, a fair market competition uh, uh, condition, or they want to promote like a positive images of games and then other creative industries. Uh, and then also in the promotional uh, policies, you know, as I uh, summarized, you know, they, they have uh, applied quite many different and uh, micro level uh, policy measures. Um, but not always, you know, they, they cannot make all the success with all these different policies. You know, there are some successes and also there are some failures. You know? For example, uh, the success factor, uh, you know, the Korean government for the last 20 years have pretty much a continued, you know, continually provided that kind of support, whether it is big or small, you know, the government policy try to be stable with some necessary budget, you know. But the failure factor, I mean, there is a controversy on this issue. You know, some people are saying that uh, consolidating the promotional institutions on the one big umbrella agency, which is COCA in 2000, 2009. Some people say this was a, uh, a, this was a necessary uh, uh, measure. Uh, while some other people are criticizing, especially the game industry people are complains, complaining that this consolidation actually weakened the professionalization and responsiveness uh, in, in, you know, uh, in game industry. So, but this is an ongoing like a controversial issue. Um, my final slide is the general evaluation on the role and impact of government policy. Any business in culture industry in Korea is basically runs in market mechanism. It means private industry initiates and the government performs supporting function through regulation and promotion. These supporting function is important as it removes or lessens legal problems, business conflicts, and social antagonism. But the government supports are not the main engine or even a plan. It just supports. The way government organizations narrates their policies need serious revision, you know, in my, in my view. For example, you know, because I mean, they they do this without having any malicious uh, intention. Obviously, they simply like uh, uh, provide all these narratives on their website, you know, uh, on what they are doing and then what they want to achieve. But if you read their papers uh, exhibited exhibited on their websites, it sounds like as if they plan and control everything, which is simply not true. So. Uh, I, you know, together with my uh, colleagues in Korea, uh, since last year, we started to uh, correct uh, some of these like, uh, you know, misleading uh, documents and websites uh, to be more uh, accurate and proper. Uh, 
uh, Korean state approaches any industry, including game industry, following the old and strong pattern of government intervention in markets. Uh, that was built through the years of economic in development in the 1960s and 70s. The law of the state in the uh, development era was direct and strong as the government controlled most of the finance through banks. Authoritarian politics in the 1970s and 80s also made it possible for the government to directly control the private sectors. But since mid 1980s, the size of the Korean economy and the level of development in the private sectors began going beyond state's capacity of uh, full control. So currently, the private initiative in most areas of industry comes first and the government's role is limited, albeit useful and significant. And I think this is a, some kind of comparable aspect uh, between Korean approach and then uh, Chinese approach in, in where uh, the government hand is heavier and then stronger. Okay, uh, that's it for my talk today. Thanks for listening. And thank you very much. Ah, <laughs> that's really fantastic. I'm, I'm fascinated to get these uh, two different perspectives uh, in one um, seminar. Okay, so I can see we have quite a few questions in the Q&A. Uh, quite a lot of them seem to have come from uh, quite a limited number of people who have been fantastically enthusiastic. Um, and that's great. We will um, attend to your questions, but please, everybody else, um, it would be great to get your questions as well. It would be wonderful to have some more diverse voices in our... So while you, you get your courage up to type in a question, um, I would like, if I may, uh, to take Chair's privilege uh, and ask you two to comment on each other. Uh, I guess you knew you were going to be in for this, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm really interested in in um, how listening to each other's perspective on China and Korea, uh, respectively, how that makes you think about um, how you understand um, your own country's um, industry. Um, Anthony, if you want to go first. Yeah, let, let me start first. In fact, as I listen to. Shin's talk. Um, I also share with uh, Shin and other Korean scholars same feeling. Um, the kind of development of global so-called global game industries in China and is is actually spake like export and internal consumption. Uh, it's it's not about um the kind of promotion of or the support largely support from the government. In fact. Um, as, as Shin also said, in fact, the government actually done a lot of promotion. Uh, it, it play a lot of fair games, things like, oh, like, like put up a, a good framework for them to develop um, a good tax like framework so that they know what to do. Um, and kind of uh, when they promote overseas, they help them um, and they do tax rebate. But the most important thing for the game industries to develop um, is about the, the, the industry's own effort. Um, it's much bigger than the government policy and the cultural policy. Um, there is also, um, this is always a kind of misconception that um, uh, China, like, like maybe in other industries, it's like that, like maybe in the mobile phone industry, telecom industry, energy and industry, um, um, like uh, in kind of like say for example the the five G industry in other parts of the in uh, in other countries, uh, the government actually plays a lot of a strong role in helping them financing them. But for the game industries, um, in China, they are always listed independent company. A lot of actually game companies are listed in Hong Kong in the stock market and also listed. In New York's stock market, um, they finance their own business. They acquire a lot of game companies in the world, and 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 you can see in their annual report, um, it's nothing about. Uh, well, I, I would say at least I don't see a lot of so-called financial subsidies 
from the government. But um, but I guess um, um, the government has done a good thing in in promoting a, a more clear um framework um for industry. Say like for for me or for Shin for anybody who want to start a company about games, they they know how to do it. And they know what the regulations are, so that's important. Like for other industries, say, um, like for think about telecommunication, for think about uh, like energy industry, there's no way for private companies to go in. Um, so that uh, so the, this is the cultural policy is not just about like like monitoring the industry, but also kind of providing a clear framework, which is. Good. So that's a this point I agree with the uh, Shin. Um, uh, but there's also a differences. Like um, the, uh, now now uh, now I would say um, uh, I know that a lot of Chinese officials actually went to Coca, uh, then uh, the, the 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 content industry in Korea. They they actually learned it from Coca. And actually, they they went there to have some formal talk. I also went to Coca to do a lot of interviews. Um. In the initial stage of development, there are a lot of regulations. So I actually I, I uh, read all the regulations. They are quite similar. But now, now, uh, now, uh, as you can see, like in, in Korea, um, there, there are very few like regulation on on content, except the kind of like like uh, like classification of games, uh, like prohibiting like like those uh, teenagers or minors from from spending too much time on games. Other than that, um, uh, the kind of content regulations is totally absent in Korean game industries. So it's actually China actually start to copy it from other game, other country industries, like in China. Say they learn it from film, not from music, um, comics as well. Um, and it seems that it becomes a kind of a, I was I would say hurdle for the industry. So in fact now um, the industries are not like like growing exponentially um, as it was in the past. Now now um, basically uh, the kind of revenue plateau uh, simply because they, they they have hard time in like producing content that might uh, like echo with the state. So though they keep on actually earning a lot of revenues from a lot of like previously previously published games, but for new games, um, to make a lot of profits, um, uh, it's more difficult. Say, uh, the government only like like approve, uh, very limited of games every year now. Um, so there's a kind of um difference between so called the free market in South Korea and the more controlled market in China. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very clear. Thank you. You know, I I was wondering. How how those um, games that were promoting the anti corruption campaign would actually go down? You know, would people actually buy them? And I think you you're giving a clear answer there, aren't you? Um, but Shin, over, over to you. What what are your reflections on on hearing that that presentation of the, the situation in China? Well, I uh, you know uh, when Anthony Professor Anthony Fong made it very clear how you know in current days uh, Chinese policy on developing game industries or culture industries is uh, self-contradicting, you know, uh, in between like, you know, a government policy with the strong tones of nationalism and, uh, and also the national branding, you know. On the one hand, China wants to show it off, you know, how China is growing strong in developing like uh, uh, culture industries. Like the recently released film, Zhang Jinhu, is one such case, you know, they, they uh, invested a huge amount of money in mobilizing uh, top level uh, directors. And uh, uh, in, in, in a week, uh, the movie already broke the box office record uh, in, within domestic market. But uh, obviously, the movie is overly nationalistic and you know uh, appealing to the domestic audience only. You know, and uh, uh, the reception on the same movie uh, in other nations are quite uh, low or even negative. 
you know. So on the one hand, mobilizing the nationalism for the development of uh, contents industry is very successful domestically, but it is only inviting a very like a, a, a kind of backrash from the global audience. So this is already uh, creating a uh, painful contradiction uh, on the part of the Chinese uh, uh, policymakers. Um, uh, and the state-driven uh, policies also uh, is with the problems between the political control and then global globalization, you know, the, 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 the contradiction or the conflict between global standard and then the desire of the uh, nation state, uh, which is stronger, you know, in, uh, in Chinese uh, situation at the, at the point. And then I think uh, Anthony pointed out uh, pretty clear on that. Um, the importance of game industry these days in, I mean, game industry compared with like a film industry or music industry in Korean context, uh, game industry is more, you know, viewed as a very profitable industry, you know, uh, in terms, in, in three uh, aspects. First, the size of the game market, as Anthony pointed out, is so huge, you know, more than the double of the global film market. And uh, in terms of the technology, you know, like AI technologies or, you know, all, you know all other kinds of new technologies are readily applicable in game like industries rather than the other cultural industries. I mean, these days, uh, even music industry, especially like uh, on contact, like online uh, concert uh, uh, is adopting more and more new, uh, newest technologies, you know, but the, in game industry, you can actually apply and then try a lot of different like uh, a leading edge uh, in this I mean, uh, technology. So developing game industry means developing the leading edge, uh, you know, uh, high tech. So in that sense, developing game industry gets a lot of importance. And thirdly, um, game industry is relatively culture blind, okay? Zhang Jinhu is a lot more culturally loaded but in game industry, even in Chinese game, the main character could come in like a blonde and then white skin, okay? So it could be a lot more cultural blind and then flexible. So in, in these respects, game industry gets a lot of uh, attention from, from both the power and money, you know? So Korean government is also paying relatively higher and then heavier uh, policy attention in developing game industry in comparison with like a film or uh, music cause film and music or so TV dramas are going on their own. You know, they do it well, you know, and then there are very, very little room for the uh, government to actually intervene. So there's a, uh, yeah, the kind of difference I, I'd say. Uh -huh. That's all very interesting. Oh dear. Um, now you're making me want to ask a bunch of more questions. Uh, I won't because it's high time we got to the um, the questions in the Q&A. But really, you know, the mention of um, culture blind is really making me think about questions of gender now. So maybe I can just drop that in and you can field it um, within your responses to these specific questions. You know, what's, what's, the, what's the gender breakdown of um, of gamers is, is how much is that a factor in uh, cultural policy and game design and all of that ha huh. but but let us turn to the the, the questions in the q a we have some great questions mark ritchie um was was in there first and has uh, actually posed a series of interesting questions mainly about um government engagement with the the chinese gaming industry so first one was how how is reactionary defined in 2021? I was wondering that, that's a good one. And perhaps we can put that together with, oh yeah, this is an interesting one. Uh, another question about the, um, um, the, the social credit system, is that inspired from games? <laughs> that's a fun one. Perhaps we'll leave, leave you with those two, Anthony, yeah. 
No, um, yeah, uh, I, I guess Mark raises a really good point. I, I actually mentioned that in my book. Um, what is reactionary is something like um, um, the empire game. Um, if you like, like, like in my, in my, like, like what well, during my university time, it was the kind of a civilization game. Now it's a kind of military game. Um, the three countries game. There is um, different countries come back to get, come back. Like it's more like wow, it, the most like like controversial reactionary game is again with the world map. So you imagine that, and and then when there's a world map post out, that means what? A country invaded another country. And, and maybe some countries like United and start a second or third world war. So this is one of the taboo in the Chinese game industry. So they, nobody is allowed to check past this night. So if, if anything is like, 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 like hints on any kinds of national invasion, no matter whether China invades other country or other country invade China, it definitely, um, like like being censored, and so this is so this is this is a more like a political um, game itself is a kind of like a, try to desensitize the political uh, sentiment. So the the government doesn't want anything related to it in the game. Um, so that's why if you you know like like I know a lot of people who play a lot of game like World of World Craft and and these kind of games. You you might know that those kind of like like fighting games in China always end up like well for somebody hurt somebody die but they don't the bloods are not red in color they're green in color so that's why they want to try to downplay this kind of um so called uh political or a kind of like uh like hatred in the games so this and and of course this is not well like for for players this is not that interesting. But but for 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 the for the for the country try to manage the industry, it tries to like lay down these kind of uh, implicit uh, some explicit rules. Um, um, so like um, and and Mark also asked the question about the the, the social point and credit system. Um, I don't know what whether it's uh like um it is being in, inspired by um the game system. But I, I would say that um, um, the social point system or the kind of like censorship system in, in China is not without, um, I would say, so-called consultation. The consultation is not like that. It's not, oh, it's not a public consultation in UK asking whether you can, uh, you can do something or not to do something. But um, uh, China always relies on a, a group of like academics, experts, um, like film critics, um, like, like game critics, um, the guild, a lot of guild for union for game gamers, they, they actually always talk to them about the policy. So it is more like, uh, it seems that like for others, like the game control censorship is a kind of black box, but for those who are in, in Beijing, who are like in the circle, they keep on talking about that. So in, in fact, um, um, maybe I would say um, uh, some of the like uh, the kind of control censorship in game is quite similar to to the kind of uh, social point credit system. I would say that they, they, this is a result of so called this kind of like public discussion within the small circle. Yeah, yeah. and I I was also talking to them as well. So that it's not that secret in in some sense. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, right, that is interesting. Huh? Yeah. Um, yes, um, while we're on the, the topic perhaps of, of government control and censorship, could we um, field uh, Lena Morosik's question? Can you see that one, um, uh, Professor Kim? So this, oh, this is um, about um, uh, discussions around historical accuracy um, concerning real events in Kore Korean dramas. So she's talking about the drama Snowdrop, which caused a very big controversy. <laughs> I, I, actually, I, I actually don't know about that drama, but uh, I, I know the question. And there's been controversies uh, over the historical correctness 
of any history dramas, you know. Uh, and this is obviously not unique to the Korean situation. You know, any any history drama, I mean, I, theoretically, it's impossible to uh, make a historically correct, correct, hundred percent correct uh, history drama. And then drama is not supposed to be a history textbook anyway. Uh, so there always a ongoing like a compromise between uh, uh, fictional creation and then uh, historical truthfulness. Okay. And then I, I think there is a uh, uh, sort of unspoken uh, uh, compromise going on between the producers and then consumers. So uh, if you are asking that if there is a, any uh, government guidelines or even a committee, as he mentioned, you know, uh, which is screening the correctness of the historical fact, I wouldn't say we have. You know, there's nothing like that, okay? It's, it's just a uh, unspoken, uh, uh, unspoken compromise constantly going on between the producers and then consumers. And then if any TV drama or movie is going over a certain sensitive line, then the, uh, you know, then there is a sort of uh, checking voice popping up either from the uh, media you know or journalism or from the websites from social media you know people immediately respond uh, with their own like uh, viewpoints or, or historical uh, facts and then challenging so uh, and then because this is not like a, a government intervention or this is not a subject to legally uh, decide there's usually a ongoing debates on, on public sphere. And then sometimes, you know, producer wins, sometimes consumer wins, you know? So I think this is a, uh, the nature of the cultural compromise usually happening in the consumption process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, that's very familiar. Yeah, I, I probably want to add something uh, on this point. Um, like in Korea, probably the, there's no, like, like clear a, a kind of finite committee which decides on whether something should be published, something should be filmed or something like that. But, uh, but in China, it would be quite, quite different. Like, um, like game, game is a, a kind of exception because the game comes out like after year 2000s. And imagine those kind of rulers, like, like, like government, like, 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 like um, civil servants, they actually they didn't know about games in the very first place. So, um, so they didn't actually control games as if they control other content industry, like film industries. Um, like for other industries, like films, I actually, I, I had a research center. I have a research center in, in Beijing. Um, now, not because of COVID, I couldn't go there. So when I was there, I always go to a lot of so-called private circle. Some, some of the private circle is about film, film circle. Um, they actually sit down with the, the Film Critique Association with some government representative. And they actually, they are the people who censor the game, censor the, the film. And they are also directors. And I am also the representative of the academics. So, so actually they decide what's going on, what, what would be published, what would be like, like allowed to be screen on, on a screen on the on, on, on theater. So um in fact they want they what they want is that in fact they want thorough discussion. When when something is coming out, there's no debate like like as as she just mentioned, okay, they want to minimize this debate before the film is released. So there's a kind of the philosophy is quite quite different. But but game is a kind of exception because game there's no no tradition of like controlling game in the first place. So uh, game is like more or less um, um, is they, they allow more discussion. But 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 when there is more discussion later, say for example the um, uh, there's a um, very popular game called called Honor of King, um, which was really popular in the past few years, the biggest game in the world. Um, there, there was too much uh, controversial because they actually distort some of the, the historical uh, like facts 
and there was a lot there was a lot of criticism so after that the company actually suffered a lot because um you may affect the kind of release of their new games in the future so that's why um uh, there's some pros and cons about this kind of uh, prior or post control yeah hi i mean this that's great and it really leads me to to something I, i've been wondering in the course of this seminar which which is about um you know how much your your engagement with the industry your practical experience how much that informs your your academic study i mean of course it must be a lot um but also you know i think this is a bit of a difference between uh, my own disciplinary background which is more kind of towards anthropology and perhaps the the norms in in um, creative industries studies, which, which seem to be much more in terms of presentation about the 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 macro level, you know. Whereas I, as an anthropologist, I'm always really hungry for these kind of specific case studies, you know, what's happening on the ground. How do these specific little um, cases really help us to understand the wider picture? You know, so I'm really fascinated by your experience of running a company, Anthony, and, and also with, with your, your experience of this think tank, um, Shin, and how that kind of uh, impacts. But sorry, I'm, I'm putting my oar in too much here. I want to come back to a couple more questions in, in the chat. There, there was quite an early one up there from Jehun Mamadov. Um, nice, asking about... Um, the influence of other cultures on the Chinese gaming industry. Um, I, I thought that was quite interesting because um, Shin was talking quite a lot about the model of like earlier American approaches to soft power, say, and then we're talking about the Korean um, impact or the, the use of Korean models in China. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Anthony, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, yeah. Um, that there's a... Well, definitely, this is a a, a whole a, a big thesis on that. Um, he or she probably can write a whole thesis on that. Um, um, I would say, um, like imagine there was no traditional so-called gaming in China, so everything was new in around like year two thousand. So think about this kind of like game characters. What should they be like? Or well, should they look like Chinese? What should they look like Korean? Um, I would say in the very in the very beginning, because a lot of new games in China were adopted from Korea. So they in fact um, a lot of like modeling, they kind of playing strategies, uh, more like Korean games. Uh, but as time goes by, people try to develop their own character, like in, in a Chinese setting. And a lot of young kids actually grow up with Japanese animation. Um, all the Japanese animation, actually, a lot of Japanese animation were prohibited in China, but they, they, they could get it anyhow on, on the internet. Um, so in fact, a lot of like, like, uh, characters on game like with yellow color, blue color, green colors, are basically Japanese characters. Um, and they can even draw these characters um, like, like and, uh, and and even more Japanese than their Japanese. Um, and now now so that's why a lot of uh, um, game companies also invest in the Japanese animation and film industries. Um, um, first of all, of course it's kind of investment. Second, because they can also bring back some of the kind of um, culture back to China for their own development. Um, so and and until right now, you would say that um, um, I would say the game industry is largely influenced by mainly by Korean early days and Japanese mainly. But the problem is now when when China say that now we want our own game, the game should like sell more Chinese culture. So a lot of uh, gamers try to artificially create some so called Chinese character in the games. And mostly were not too successful. Um, and for those who are successful, say they may modify from an old character from a historical past, for, say from an epic story. 
But the problem is when, when they change the epic story, the kind of old tradition, Chinese tradition, and turn it into characters, they may distort that character. And then you will invoke some kind of criticism from the public. And that also create another dynamic. So, um, so for, I guess for them to, to play safe, Japanese characters are still, or they look like Japanese characters, um, are still the safest way for them to, to continue to develop the industries. That is funny. <laughs> Uh, well, another channel of uh, transferring the influence between the countries is the actual like uh, working people across the nation borders. For example, I have a friend of mine, a Korean man, operating a game company, game production company in Changzhou, uh, in hmm. southern China. You know, he he started his business in Beijing first, but uh, like almost. Uh, some 12 years ago, 13 years ago. And, but soon after he moved down to Changzhou because Changzhou uh, is a city close to Nanjing in which Chinese government, you know, local government created a, a industrial complex uh, to host like uh, game companies from, uh, from abroad, including Korea, you know. So if you go there, it's like uh, the Korean government's providing uh, startups uh, with uh, facilities and then space at the, for free or at very low cost. So he could enjoy renting a facility there in Changzhou, uh, game industry complex at a very, very nominal price for, for a long time. So, so when, when uh, now he's living in there for like 20, 12 years and then traveling back and forth between Korea and China, obviously he has the networks between the two countries, you know, so that the, it, this is a actual line, how the influence is being transferred on a daily basis. Yeah, but actually that what you have just said actually created another question. In that like you always hear like in international trade debate, uh, say uh, Europe always said, okay, uh, China actually subsidized its agricultural industry and then export it to other places. And uh, you can say also, actually, the United States also subsidized, actually support a lot of technological development for its like 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 the like yellow bean industry and then actually export to China. Now, now in the past, we we actually we celebrate so called the free market, but now now think about these creative industries. Um, maybe except in the early days in Harlem. Now this is no purely free market. Um, <laughs> say a lot, 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 most of the Chinese uh, film, film industry actually rely on Korean film industry because they, they actually send their films to Korea for post-production. Why? Because the, the course is, they, they, actually I talked to them a lot, the course is even less than half half of the price than the, the local production, simply because the Korean, Korean government actually subsidized every post-production house when they actually take on uh, other, other, pro, other company, other countries like, like post-production product. And, and so that's why, oh, and even well, of course, as a commercial industry, like film companies, they definitely look for a, a cheaper solution. Um, and, and for game industry, as you said, like there is a lot of this kind of so-called Silicon Valley in China. Actually, they subsidize um, the kind of uh, game development. Like say, actually, they free they have free maybe housing allowance, free free, free rental, whatever, and a lower tax, uh, like 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 from the city. And that 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 kind of um, like benefit could be a kind of uh, so-called the subsidies of the industries. Um, no, no, so that's why when, when the, the world actually competes, uh, like different countries compete like on, on real trade, on get like, like these creative industries. Now it's rarely can we see a, a, a kind of like really pure market, pure market, free market kind of competition. Now, now at the back, somehow, there are some kind of support from the state. And maybe this is something 
new for the world, say a soft power for many countries are, are important, although they may not say that. <laughs> These things always work out in ways that perhaps the governments did not quite anticipate when they uh, formulated their policies. Hey. But gentlemen, uh, it's been a really great experience to um, have you both kind of firing off each other like this. It's made a very lively Q&A. Thank you so much. Uh, but I see that our 90 minutes are well and truly up. And so I think we must draw to a close. Um, apologies to those questions that we didn't get to. Um, I do encourage you, if I may, to, to reach out directly to our speakers. Their emails, I think, are on the, um, the website. And if, if they have a moment in their very busy schedules, I hope they'll get back to you. Um, I, I can see one question requesting um, uh, to share the slides. I would say that the whole um, seminar has been recorded and will be available on the SARS China Institute website. So that might be a good way of... Of, of looking back. Um, so I think it just remains for me to, to say a huge thank you to our two speakers, so Professor Anthony Fung and Professor Shin Dong Kim. I wish, wish you all the best um, with your research. Thank you for joining us on Zoom and I hope you'll be able to come to London some point. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely business. come if uh, I can travel. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for inviting. Thank you, Shin, for like, like, like joining this kind of discussion. Hope to see Thank you, you very all much. In, in person. Yeah.